change, I will not be telling you where I work, what I do, and how fun I think it is, because this is something I get to do entirely in my free time. So this is just me. Um, and I'm going to start out with a little story about why I'm doing this before I get into how it works. And I'm starting with what I call the parable of the climbing wall. A while back, some friends of mine and I went to a big outdoor fair. And they had this climbing wall. And it was a really cool climbing wall. And instead of just being a vertical surface with all these little grabbies like you see in the stock art that I pulled, this climbing wall had all sorts of different surfaces on it. And it was at different angles. So sometimes you were climbing, you could scramble. There were places you could stand. Um, vertical and lateral movement and all sorts of different things. There were even some places to hang from. And, you know, it was set up really well. They had all the people with the liability forms and they had, you could get a helmet and you could get somebody to rope you up so that you were absolutely safe in this whole thing. And they had instructors to help you climb the climbing wall and people there to make sure there was absolutely no screwing around on the climbing wall. Well, I was there with my buddies from an experimental military knife fighting club and a search and rescue team. The first thing we wanted to do was make sure there was screwing around on the climbing wall. So we ran out and got some of our gear. I'm the search and rescue medic, so I did have my medic bag on call just in case. Um, but we're like, this thing's over soft grass. We all know what we're doing. We have some really experienced climbers and some well-trained knife fighters. So we cleared out all the everybody else, cordoned off the area for a little bit, and got out a bunch of training knives. For those of you who haven't trained in knife fighting, you know that a guy is a really serious knife fighter when he has a box of half-used bright red lipstick under his bed. Because you coat the training knives with lipstick so you know who's gotten hit. And then there we were, uh, knife fights on the training wall. Because it was the thing to do and it was fun. And it made you test some skills you don't, don't normally use. Because how many people get in a knife fight while climbing something? Not so much outside of the movies. But it was fun. And it was interesting. And there was some risk involved. But we knew what we were doing. And we had a medic on hand. These are two very different ways of looking at the world. Some people want to know nothing will go wrong. Some people want that safety. They want all the forms. They want the helmet. They want to be roped up. They want a harness. They want to know that if they fall, they'll instantly be caught. And they don't have to pay any consequences if something goes wrong. For other people, that's not a very interesting way to live. We know that if we constantly challenge ourselves, if we accept some risk, if we accept that some things going wrong is part of life, we plan for the fact that some things may go wrong, that we grow more, we learn more, and we get to do more interesting things, and we get some interesting stories along the way. What I'm about to tell you is entirely for the second type of person, the people who absolutely want to screw around on the climbing wall. We also believe in the importance of failure. And when I say we, I'm really starting to talk about hacker culture now. Um, the Onion Futures Market, which is the organization I'm going to tell you about, was named after one hell of a failure. Um, I don't know how many in this group know a lot about financials market, but the only commodity that it is illegal to trade on a futures market in America is onions since 1958. Why, you may ask, have we outlawed trading futures on onions? Well, in 1955, two traders named Siegel and Kasuga bought 98% of the onions in America through futures contracts. And they did this via the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is where most agricultural futures are traded still today. And these guys were a little new at this and didn't quite have the whole theory down. And they said, well, we did this on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, so clearly we need to ship all the onions to Chicago in order to sell them. So suddenly, a little over 30 million pounds of onions were in Chicago, rotting in mountains in shipping yards. The rest of the country, by the way, could not buy onions. So no onion rings for you in 1955 if you happen to, say, live in Charlotte, North Carolina unless you happen to know someone who had a really nice garden in their backyard. You were simply out of luck. And on top of that, these two gentlemen realized that their gigantic supply of onions was beginning to not look so good. So they shipped them out of Chicago to be cleaned and rebagged and shipped back in, in the hope that they would sell. So now people who were slightly less observant than one might hope they would be thought there were twice as many onions in Chicago. 
and the price plummeted even further, driving the price of onions down to 10 cents for a 50 pound bag of onions. The people who made the bags for the onions went bankrupt and lost their businesses because the price of onions had gone down so low. And a number of farmers also faced financial hardship because the future value of onions was now beginning to be predicted to be very low. And the rest of the country just couldn't have onions in their soup and couldn't have onion rings for about a year. Um, Congress decided that this was a massive problem and we needed to stop this from ever happening again. Probably led, I, I don't know the exact history here, but I'm I firmly believe it started with someone who didn't get onions in some dish that they really, really wanted for about a year and they were angry about it. Um, so in 1958, the Onion Futures Act was signed into law. It banned trading futures contracts on onions and on motion, motion picture box office receipts, which are not a commodity, but you, you also can't trade futures on the receipts you would get from having movies. So, yeah, that's how we named ourselves because we want to point out that failure is important. Um, we don't believe in overreacting to failure. We want people to have room to screw up because if people don't take the chance of screwing up, we don't improve, we don't grow. That's a lot of what hacking is about. We're like, okay, let's slap this together and find out if it works. We're not gonna spend four months theorizing. We're not gonna spend four months finding out if it's perfect. We're gonna build it and test it, and if it's terrible, we found that out in about a week, and we're gonna throw it away, and we're gonna try something else. Hackers at play involve unknowns. We tend to be people who enjoy experimentation and learning and growth and questioning things and challenging things and being a little irregular. There's a lot of chaos to be had. And unfortunately for us, this has led in many ways to what I call the fall of hacker cons. I really love self and I love coming back here, but self is becoming more and more unique as time passes. Um, it was announced a few months ago that this will be Derby cons last year. It's one of my favorite InfoSec cons out in Louisville. But unfortunately, um, some people found some things to be offended about. And there was a lot of social media kerfuffle over some manufactured drama and some issues with vendors and some other fallout. And the volunteer organizers just decided they weren't going to deal with it anymore. And I don't blame them. They were putting a lot of work into that event on behalf of the community. And they are not the first. I've watched several cons that I truly love fall this way in the last few years. And I started thinking about why does this happen? And this is the core problem as far as I'm concerned. There was a time when hacker cons were places that hackers went away to do our own thing. But as tech became big business, we had to involve the rest of the business. So suddenly, Hacker cons became tech cons. They became places that weren't just for hackers, but were also for marketing people and management and investors and distributors and support people and all of these other people that we needed to fold in who are not from hacker culture. And that doesn't mean that they're bad, but they came in with very different expectations than hackers have. Because frankly, we're a little irregular, guys. In case you haven't noticed, look around the room. Uh, and so mixing our play with our work meant that we were bringing in a bunch of people who weren't hackers to an environment they weren't prepared for and possibly didn't even desire. That's why some of the cons that have been completely unaffected by this are cons that are run by businesses such as the O'Reilly Conference Series. It's a great conference series. I love it. It's run by a tech publisher that I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, I really enjoy their events, but these are definitely places where work is done. You go in, you promote your book, you talk about a technology you're using and how it affects your business. You talk to investors, it's that kind of conference. Um, the government information security conferences and technology conferences I go to are also equally unaffected because we go and it's a place where you go to do work. So it became very clear that the answer was that things were surviving when work and play was separate. The the standout was we're losing a lot of spaces for hacker play. So of course we need to give play its own space. And that's when the idea came around to form the Onion Futures Market. And this is a model I really want to share with others because 
I believe that others can use it. So whether any of you become interested in our group or not, this is a model you may be able to use for groups of your own. And the most important feature here is that our group is formed as a private membership club. This is not a charity and this is not a company. So we don't face the pressures that those organizations face and we have a structure that's very protective of our way of being, our way of socializing, and our way of playing. So as a company, we would have to you know, turn a profit at some point. We would have to make our clients and our shareholders happy. We don't have to do those things because we're a club. As a charity, our primary purpose is to serve others outside of ourselves. And that's a problem because a lot of tech conferences are actually organized as charities. So you can't say we're here for our own community because by legal definition, you're not. That's part of being a 501c3, is that you're supposed to be there for the greater community around you. So here are five things that we did. Um, the first four are basic features of being a 501c7 private social club under IRS regulations in America. The fifth one is a little bit of a hack that I came up with, with the help of my fellow board members, that I call the ideological copyleft. And it's a way that I really wanted to protect hacker culture and hacker play by using the structure that we have. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn and then see where we go from there. The first one is this is about play, not work. And as a matter of fact, one of the funniest things that I'm waiting for this to happen is for someone to say, you're not being professional. And for me to say, but the IRS said I'm not allowed to be. Because in the regulations, there's a URL down here if you want to see it for yourself. Um, in the regulations for a 501c7 club, it says, I quote, a social club must be organized for pleasure, recreation, and other similar purposes. In other words, the IRS said I cannot be professional. I am here for pleasure and recreation. Um, this second piece, an essential earmark of an exempt social club is personal contact, commingling, etc. The big deal at the end, I'm going to come back to later, it says members must share interests and have a common goal directed toward pleasure, recreation, and similar purposes. This is going to be very important when we get to the part about the ideological copy left, so please remember it. Both of these come from the IRS information on forming social clubs. But this forms a sort of structure that's going to get us where we want to go. The next requirement from the IRS is limited membership. If you're a club, you have to have a membership. You can't just serve everyone out there or you're not a club anymore. So this is how we handled the idea of limited membership without saying that you have to live in a certain town or have a certain profession in order to be considered a hacker. So you don't have to actually join Onion Futures Market to come to our events. You can attend if you are a guest or a family member of a member in good standing. Those guests, I'm just going to roll them all up together as guests, need to be invited by a member. And if there are any attendance fees for an event, your attendance fees must be paid by the member who sponsored you. And they're responsible for making sure you understand the culture, you understand what you're getting into, and maybe showing you around a bit. For those of you who are interested in really being part of this, you can apply for membership. There's a really simple application process. Um, it gets passed to a membership committee for acceptance. And then you have to agree to subscribe to the purposes and goals of OFML. Um, a moment on the acronym. We found out when we incorporated this in the state of Indiana, Onion Futures Market, we had to pick one of those like corporate words to tack on the end. And we're just looking at, well, we could be corp or we could be incorporated. And I'm like, no, limited. And the rest of the board members are like, why that? We're not an LLC. And I said, no, look at the acronym, guys. It's lim So yeah, we're Onion Futures Market Limited just because I like the acronym. Uh, so you have to agree to the purposes and goals and to abide by the bylaws. That includes paying annual dues. That's how we support the organization. I'll get into the financial bits in a minute. And you have to be over 18 because according to US law, you can't agree to belong to a 501c7 social club if you're under 18. Um, because we allow family member guests, that shouldn't be an issue for anyone. Um, only regular members get to vote. That's really important because we don't want to suffer from someone showed up 
and decided to submit a member applica membership application just so that they can vote all the hacker activities that bother them off the island. So in order to become a voting member, you have to be an associate member in, stand in good standing for more than 16 months and show up at two events. We're not asking for your firstborn child. We're not asking for a blood donation. We just want you to stick around enough that we know that you care about the organization and understand what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the only special thing that you get as a voting member is you can vote on who will serve on our organizational board. And you can help ratify changes to the bylaws if we ever try to change the bylaws. So here's another fun IRS requirement that I think helps us stay a hacker con. Income must come from members. For the social club to be a social club under IRS regulations, we have to get all but six, all but 35%, so 65% or more, of our money directly from our members. We can't get that money from guests. We can't get that money from donors. We can't get that money from other people. So this is really a member-supported organization, which is why we have dues. But it also means that we are not beholden to do things in a way that keep our donors happy. We're not tempted to get on that gravy train because we are legally prohibited from getting on that gravy train. As a matter of fact, um, if we ever top 15% of our income getting, coming from the general public, we lose our IRS status and we are no longer tax exempt. The next big cool feature of a private club and here's something you definitely don't get with a charity is member privacy. Um, many of us have seen controversies out there in the tech world that can generally be characterized as guilt by association. You hang out with the wrong people, you read something that says the wrong things, you are now suspect. Especially in ways that can affect employment if you work for the wrong organization. I'm very lucky, I can be very out about who I am and what I do because I happen to work for a publicly funded entity that just doesn't have the right to screw with me, and actually people who care about intellectual independence. Not everyone is in that position. There is a lot of case law, and by a lot, I mean hundreds of years back to the beginning of America and before, protecting the privacy of members of a private social club. If you're ever wondering why it's really hard for someone to go out and subpoena the member roles of certain clubs and that the Supreme Court's turned it over, it's because they used a structure like this. Because the Bill of Rights says there's a freedom of association and that has included that someone can't go out and catalog all your associations. We're seeing in the tech world this falling down a little bit with social media and things because that's a new area of case law. This is case law that's hundreds of years old. And that's something I really like. So for those of us who are standing on the board, our names have to be public because we're taking financial responsibility for the organization. We are managing the books, we're managing the IRS paperwork, and we're managing all of the governmental interactions involved with having the incorporation. That's currently three people. Everyone else gets confidentiality. Part of our culture is that we do not record or photograph at any of our events. If we catch someone recording or photographing, we will eject them and remove them from our, the organization or bring it up for a vote to remove them from the organization. Um, we intend for people to have a space to be themselves, to screw up, to say the wrong thing, and not have all the consequences in the world come down on their heads. Because even though those events are exceedingly rare, the fact that they happen and the fact that when they happen and who they will happen to is extremely unpredictable does cause people to self-censor. And I feel that it's inhibiting growth in our community in a lot of ways. So member privacy is very near and dear to my heart because I feel that it lets people come out of their shells. It lets people experiment and it lets people feel like they're allowed to be wrong. They're allowed to say the wrong thing. So the Onion Futures market mission as an ideological copy left. Those of you who remember the early days of the intellectual property wars on software, um, there were a lot of people who saw copyright itself as a great evil because how could you own an idea? And then there were some people who said, wait a minute, if I own software, I can license it. I can license it in a way that ensures that it can be shared freely. And that's how we got open source licenses. And the idea was referred by many, 
referred to by many as copyleft, as opposed to copyright. We're doing something similar with onion futures market bylaws that I call an ideological copyleft. If you'll remember from an earlier slide, you have to subscribe to a shared goals and mission in order to be part of a private social club. That's an IRS requirement. So that sounds like something that says that we all have to think alike, which is the opposite of what hackers want. Well, we managed to turn that around. Our mission statement written into our bylaws says that the Onion Futures Market is a private social club for individuals interested in future technologies and economies and in extreme self-improvement and self-reliance. It goes on to say how this is linked to thinking independently, that we are open to new ideas. There is no idea that is off limits for exploration. You must accept this in order to be a member of the Onion Futures Market, and you must behave consistently with this at any meeting, event, or online venue that is part of the Onion Futures Market. This is our ideological copy left. You must accept the ideology of not forcing out other ideologies in order to be part of this group. So this is something that we did to protect our group and our play space on a legal and organizational level to help make it strong. And there are a lot of things that we're doing on a cultural level. Um, if you'll see over here on my list, I talk about building culture through sessions like killing sacred hogs. Many of you have heard the expression killing sacred cows. It's when you open up and criticize an idea that is so sacred that you're not supposed to ever talk about it or question it. Um, we consider this a core of our culture. So at our upcoming event in August, one of the things we plan to do is to share a meal. I'm hoping for a hog roast if we have enough money to pull it off. And we've rented out an amphitheater, like literally an outdoor amphitheater. And there's gonna be good food, hopefully pulled pork. And you stand up and you give a five to seven minute lightning talk on the most controversial topic you can come up with. Doesn't even matter if you believe it, you're welcome to play devil's advocate. And then people get to question you for the remainder of your 10 minute slot. And then you go and the next person goes. Because one of the first cultural attributes that we want to establish is there is nothing that is off limit to discuss or debate. In this environment, everything is fair game. And those are the sort of cultural markers that we want to set up. So as I mentioned, our first event is coming up this August. It'll be in a forest in southern Illinois, or southern Indiana. God, I don't want to be in Illinois. I like Indiana. Um, we have a member site up in an online chat. We currently have three board members. We have 16 associate members, 13 who've already onboarded online, and three more who are getting onboarded soon. Um, our incorporation bylaws and banking are done. As I get into how can you do this process, you'll find out that that's a really important step. Our 501c7 application with the IRS is in progress. We are doing this soon enough that we get to do the short form application, so it should be pretty straightforward. And we're making mistakes. We're experimenting with things. You know, this is all a work in progress, but I wanted to share the model because I think this is important and we're going to need it going forward. Um, because I think that we don't always want to be at SuitCon. I love SuitCon. I get a lot of work done at SuitCon. SuitCon is kind of my generic term for the business and government conferences that I go to where I do technology. I connect with people who will help my work motivations. Um, and you can make a lot of really cool things happen. There's people to network with. There are lots of positive things. But SuitCon is not for play. SuitCon is for business. And hackers need to play. So if you've thought about building your own, here's the recipe. And I'll give it to you in four steps. Step one is your mission and your founding members. And you need to think really hard about this. A lot of people think mission and vision statements are very hot pie in the sky and fluffy and not that related to things that hackers care about. Well, let me tell you the opposite is true. Because getting this right means the difference between having a cohesive group and having a bunch of infighting and people who are basically trying to wreck each other to get their own way. Your founding members need to be a small group of people who are at least 150% the quality of the people you hope to recruit long term. Okay? So think about the people that you know. Think about who sets good examples for others. Think about who's easygoing and great to be around. Think about who's the person who makes things better when they're there. Think about who makes you accept new ideas or makes you think about things in a way you hadn't thought about them before. Those are your founding members. And you need to agree on a mission statement. 
And I'm going to be really, really clear here. Um, the reason that we wrote the Onion Futures Market mission statement the way we did, we talked about being interested in tech future technologies and economies. We talked about coming together for play. We talked about radical self-reliance and self-improvement. Sorry, I needed the help in the middle of a talk. Um, the reason that we did that is if you talk about identity in a mission statement, what you get is what we call the tyranny of small differences. The group ends up breaking down by figuring out who is the purest, best identity marker. And you end up with a lot of infighting and things break down. When you build a mission around a value and an endeavor, a thing to do and a guideline for how to know when you're doing it well, you succeed. So what you really want is a mission that is an action. It's a thing you can do. And if you're really smart, you have both an action and a quality. And that gives you a really great mission that people can wrap themselves around really long term. So once you get that settled, you need all of this legal stuff. You need to incorporate. Um, in the state of Indiana, this is really simple, and I can walk anyone who's interested in Indiana through the process. It's a form that took me about a little less than 10 minutes to fill out after straightening out people who have hard to spell addresses. Um, cost $31, took me 10 minutes. I immediately got a PDF response from the state. Um, Illinois is pretty expensive. It costs over $100, and the PDF form's a little more obnoxious, and they get back to you in a few days. Um, I haven't done this in a lot of other states. In Delaware, you usually have to hire a registered agent. Um, whatever state you're in, learn about your state. Hopefully, your Secretary of State's office will have good information online. Once you do the incorporation, you're going to need bylaws. And bylaws are like the constitution of your organization. They are not, the most important thing to know is bylaws are not about the people in the organization today. Because if you did a good job of seeking founding members, until you all go your separate ways, the organization is going to run well regardless of what kind of crap you put on paper. Pardon my language. What the bylaws are about is providing a structure that will survive the times when the best people aren't in charge or you don't have enough of the best people in charge. I don't care what your political affiliations are in this room, but if you think back over the last generation or two, you will think of someone who has been in high political office in this country who you think is basically Satan. We might not agree on which one was basically Satan, but you can think of at least one. And the country survived. That's what we're going for here. Assume that you will not always have the leadership that you want and the organization needs to survive. We are very willing to share our bylaws with new organizations if you'd like that to learn from or to use an, as an example and then just start from that basis and then tweak as you go. So once you have those things done, you'll need a bank account. Um, part of the reason that we formed a legal entity is you need places to meet. We needed to rent out this park facility. Um, since we didn't have the legal entity in the banking when we needed to reserve, what happened was I put $2,000 into reserving things, renting things, and paying for things on behalf of the organization. And I'm waiting for people to slowly pay me back. That's not how you run a group effort. What we want long term is a situation where everybody puts in some money and the organization can take care of these things on behalf of the group. That's why we form a legal entity, because it can rent out event space. It can buy supplies. It can do things that we need. Um, and also, it gives us that nice privacy right. So getting that together. Um, I will say that I have in the past run a nonprofit organization where someone chose a tiny local bank that only existed in their suburb. It caused years of negative fallout for that organization because this is a volunteer endeavor. This volunteer endeavor will see personnel turnover and they will not all live in that one tiny suburb that has that tiny one branch bank. I'm not going to tell you which bank to choose but the qualifiers you're looking for are the bank is well set up to do remote transactions. They can handle a lot of the interaction with the bank not happening in person. And the bank has enough branches that throughout the life of the organization and its personnel turnover, you're not likely to have to frequently, and by frequently I mean more than every 10 years or so, change banks in order to get branches that are close enough 
to your volunteers that you can do your work effectively. Because the last thing you want to do is force people to stop thinking about hacking and start thinking about bank paperwork frequently. How many of you like bank paperwork? Raise your hands. I see zero hands in this room, which is precisely what I expected. So don't make that mistake. Um, you want really your overhead to be as low as possible in administering the organization as you go forward because we want to think about hacking. We want to think about how much liquid nitrogen can I ship into this campsite? And what can I do with it once it's there? That's what you want to be spending your cycles on, not your banking problems. So after that gets running, you want to file your 501c7 application with the IRS. This is really important to do quickly. The speed with which you submit that application determines your application process. The IRS has two processes that you might end up in. One is fairly light and quick and predictable. The other one involves a heck of a lot more paperwork, especially financial paperwork, can, involved in, can involve an audit, it doesn't all the time, and involves lots of legal back and forth with the IRS. We don't like that heavyweight process, it sucks. The way that you end up in the heavyweight process is by one of two means. One is having a lot of money. There is a certain minimum amount of money that you go over, and I'm sorry I forgot to write the number in my notes, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. If you have that much money when you're filing, or in the time since the organization was founded and you file, you have to do the heavy process. The other thing is time. If you wait too many months between forming the organization and filing for your 501c7 status, you end up with the heavyweight process. So if you do the 501c7 early in your lifespan, when you don't have a lot of money, and when you haven't existed for very long, you get to do the lightweight process, which is much less paperwork. And we've already established that hackers hate paperwork. And I don't think most of us like playing with the IRS a whole lot either. So um, make it simpler, do it early. And then you go into sustainability mode, and that's the fun part. You know, we do all of this work, which none of us like, but we realize is necessary to get to here. This is where we want to be. We want to be at the point where we're having great events that make people want to come back, where we're making connections, where we are learning new things, where we're coming up with what demo am I going to show off next year, where we're talking about, hmm, can I really start a special interest group for lock picking? I think we have enough people now. That's the kind of stuff we want to be spending our time and focus on, and that's sustainability mode. And if you've set your dues levels reasonably so that you have enough money to keep the organization going, but you're not basically booting out everyone who doesn't make at least you know, $200,000 a year, if you have a handful of people who are willing to really drive your big annual event, because you really want to, to meet the IRS requirements of having at least an annual member meeting, you're going to want to have one big central event, even if most of your things are done in smaller events. If you have people dedicated enough to run that event, um, you go. You're sustainable. You do paperwork about once a year, um, as long as people are keeping up the financial books in between. You keep minutes of your meetings. And you have this really wonderful thing that can last for decades and decades. Um, some 501c7s date back to whenever the regulation was written, and some of them really date back hundreds of years before that because they were clubs under other legal structures. So this is a really survivable model, or I believe it is, and that's one of the reasons that we picked it up. So thanks. You are welcome to get a hold of me in the hallway if you have questions that you don't want on tape, or you can grab me via email. Um, this is my Twitter handle. I will warn you, I only really sign into Twitter when I'm at conferences, so this is getting turned off basically tomorrow. Um, Security.engineering just has links to some of the other stuff that I do. But I'm happy to take questions in here as well. I'd really like to hear what people think. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. How do you join? That's a really good one. So if you want to join Onion Futures Market, you need to get sponsored by an existing member. I will tell you that Jeremy Sands, who runs this conference, and I are on the board, so we are very public as being existing members. You're welcome to approach either of us and ask. We would both love to see some new people. 
There are some other unfeatures market members wandering around this conference, but I will not out them if they're not prepared to out themselves. Um, but all you need to do is find a member who's willing to sponsor you, and you can apply for membership. So chat around and you'll find them. Feel free to tag me after this, uh, after this event. I will be standing in the hallway directly outside the door. Well, the paperwork itself really is going to take us, will be done within the next week or two. Um, it's really pretty simple. As far as getting it turned around by the IRS, we don't know because so few of these are submitted every year that we don't have a lot of data on it. Um, they used to be really common in as late as the 50s and 60s, and the number of applications from what I can tell and there is limited data available has fallen off. So I don't really know what to expect in terms of a timeline. We're just going with the flow. Anybody else? Okay, so our annual members meeting is going to be in southern Indiana. We're um, roughly located outside of Bloomington, Indiana. We're, we used my home address to incorporate just because it was convenient. Um, however, we have set up a structure where we can do SIGs or special interest groups. Basically, if two or three members are interested in doing a SIG, we're going to give you a SIG. We're, we don't have a really high weight process for that. And once you have a SIG, one form of SIG we expect is going to be a topic-based SIG, like I'm going to start a lock picking group. But another thing that we expect is regionals. So if somebody says, I want to start a SIG that is the North Carolina or Charlotte Onion Futures Market chapter, we're totally cool with that. And then we would start having more Charlotte, North Carolina events. So if you want there to be events somewhere that is not Indiana, find, you know, get me three people who are interested in organizing it, become members, and we will make sure that you can start a regional. And that's really nice because you don't have to go through the bylaws, the organization forming process. You can write on our banking on our 501c7. And as long as you're willing to take our ideological copy left with you, which is something that's unique to us and keep that open-minded behavior and culture, we are happy to have you. Anybody else? So it's given me, it sounds like a lot of uh, structure that has, has given you or some of it all like that. Um, so basically, part of your copy left, how do you, and I'm doing this fairly fresh, but how do you get to um, divergent thought of our of both goals? Mm -hmm. So one of the cool things about being member funded and having dues is our expenses and our income scale together. Because if 45 people decide to go make a fork, they take their dues with them, but they also take 45 people and 45 people's dues. It scales linearly. So we're pretty well protected because we don't have any financial or organizational incentive to benefit from being a particular size. So we have no reason to stop people from forking. We don't have any reputational gains. We don't, you know, if, if you're looking at software projects, there are benefits of scale that you get when running a software project that tend to make people try to resist forks. There are also reputational motivators. Um, whereas technically, yes, you can always go start a fork, but then who are the donors going to go to? Because the money's not tied to particular members, they're tied to who gets to woo the donors in this direction or that. Um, we don't have any of those motivations, so our attitude is pretty much, here's what we're doing. If you don't like it, we will happily give you copies of all our paperwork and templates so you can go start your own in your own way. And the voting members get to decide who's on the board, and the board drives the organization. However, the board cannot unilaterally change the bylaws. That has to be ratified by the voting members. So we aim to change the structure as little as possible and just leave it in place and let people run and do their own things. We've also kept the central OFML group fairly small and focused. And we count on a lot happening in, happening in special interest groups. 
with the idea that, say someone wants to do a climbing group, which is way outside of our scope. Our answer would be, that's out of our scope, we're not maintaining it, but if you want to do it as a special interest group, go for it. We just need three people to write down their names that they're willing to organize it, and somebody to be the primary. So the idea is to be as loosely organized and coupled as we can, while keeping, you know, the only things that we insist on is ideological copyleft and privacy for members. Everything else is go do your own thing. So there is, so you do have a copy of the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Um, it's written into the bylaws, which I'm happy to give copies of to anybody who's interested. Um, basically, the board members are empowered to do what we call a temporary emergency censure. Um, if we have someone who's, for example, photographing people without their permission at an event would be something that would cause that. Um, because some people don't want to be publicly associated with the group, especially if they're in a tough employment situation. Um, then a board member can eject them from events and ban them from events from, I'm not, I don't have the bylaws in front of me, I believe it's a 72 hour period. And then it's put to a vote of the full board and the full board can remove them. And if someone is removed by the full board, they have to be voted back in by, uh, I believe it's a super majority of the board, if they, get, if they wish to apply for membership again, they can't just come back in via the membership committee. Um, the membership committee consists of at least one board member, but is typically members who have volunteered to help check out new members. So the idea is to rotate that so that you know, nobody has to do it too much because it's work. Ironically, the Quaker community was actually established as a 501c8 organization, which is very similar to 501c7. Yes, 501c8s are like a religious 501c7, basically. Right. And it's, it's basically the same thing, but for a fraternal or religious organization. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's actually, you're, 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 you hit the nail on the head because it's almost the exact same setup. So there's more yep. to it, but it's not hierarchical. It's actually the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, we're a little more chaotic than a lot of things. <laughs> um, and as a matter of fact, when the, the hilarity of the board meetings when we were choosing a voting system for the board members was kind of terrifying because all of three of us are electoral geeks and one's a cryptographer. So the, I, I, as the person who's also a social engineer and uh, crisis communicator and has a psych background, I'm going, this is awesome, but no, you cannot inflict this on people. Scale it down, scale it down. And I was the one forcing people to scale it down until it was uh, completely sane, but. Mm -hmm. It's all crypto. Yep. <laughs> You're not paranoid if they might really be out to get you. Mm -hmm. And that's really why we try to do, um, so I personally do not subscribe to the idea that we can, through some structure, drum out human bias. Um, humans are biased creatures. I'm biased against all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm biased against nine millimeter uh, bullets because I grew up on the south side of Chicago and I have seen so many people die from over penetration because somebody in the next trailer over to where a kid was playing, um, had a fight with the cops and the cop's bullet over penetrated and a kid died or something like that. I just won't carry nine millimeter. That's a bias, it's not fair. There are plenty of cases when carrying nine millimeter is pretty reasonable, but I don't like it. Um, so instead of trying to pretend that we can create correct human bias, we try to have enough people involved that somebody's gonna raise their hand and say, wait a minute, this is stupid, we're not doing this, guys. 
And I think that that's where a lot of organizations run wrong and where we're a little safer because we have that explicit ideological copy left is we have a culture that says everyone's allowed to question everything. Um, I have been in a lot of organizations that went horribly wrong because no one was willing to say, wait a minute, this is stupid. I don't care if you're in authority. This is stupid. Don't do that. And part of why I wanted an organization like this to exist is we have too much of the world telling people to sit down and shut up. We need a place for those of us who aren't going to. I expect more of the people in this group. And um, when we're not in the middle of a talk, I could tell you some stories about that someday. But it, it's a behavior. I, I want to encourage people to challenge ideas, including mine. Tell me when I'm being stupid. That's my safety net. <laughs> I think I'm biased against both. I don't like 9 millimeter or poor marksmanship. But if you have good marksmanship, So currently we have three board members. Um, I'm the president of the board, which means I have no real power, but I get to try to inspire people. And I have to organize the meeting and tell people, you know, hey, it's your turn to talk. Um, our treasurer is Daniel Franca, who is, he's the cryptographer I mentioned. Um, so he's really bright and awesome, and he's handling a bunch of the money stuff. Um, our secretary is Jeremy Sands, who most of you here at Self should know by now. Um, he's the one who walks around with my very favorite staff member. You know, the furry one. <laughs> um, so uh, we are the board in total currently. At our board meeting, in, or at our membership meeting in August, we're hoping to vote in two to three more board members. Um, we started out pretty light just because after DerbyCon announced its shutdown, we really wanted to get formed and start the 501c7 process. Um, our hope is to end up with seven to nine board members pretty soon, but make sure that people's terms aren't all expiring at the same time. Yep, I get to inspire people and try to make them take turns talking. That is my power. That is a longer discussion than we have time for right now. Um, any other questions? That's a great question, and I'm going to try to repeat it succinctly because deep voices in the corner are hard to hear. Um, there is a situation that can happen, and we've seen it in at least one prominent nonprofit, where we have an activist board where a few new people get voted in, they take control of the group's board, and start doing something that is contrary to the board's stated mission, or the organization's stated mission. And they haven't been ousted because while nominally there are enough voting members of the organization to get rid of this problem. Most of them are disconnected enough from the organization that they don't really know what's going on or they haven't ever really voted. Um, this typically happens in large nonprofits where your membership is the total of all the people who have ever donated us more than $5. Um, which gets you into a lot of trouble because your donors may not know a lot about the organization other than an ad they saw that moved them to donate some small amount of money. And then you have a, a very large quorum. You have a large number of members that are required to vote to do anything, and you can't get enough members together to do anything. 
So we worked around this in our bylaws in a few different ways. And I'm running short on time, so I'm going to try to do a brief description. But again, see me for a copy of the bylaws if you want details on how we worked around this. Um, so first of all, we were very careful about who becomes a voting member. Everyone who comes to our events, that's not our voting membership. Our voting membership are people who are involved enough, they've been a member in some way for at least 16 months, and they've shown up to at least two events. And this is really important because we believe that showing up in person is a sign that you're actually engaged with what's going on. The next thing is, while there is a minimum quorum, in, quorum requirement in numbers for most votes of the membership, for the annual member meeting, which is special, it happens once per year, it's usually going to be southern Indiana because that's where we're primarily located, we have some special things there. First of all, for that meeting, you do not need to notify us very far ahead of time if you want to vote remotely. Um, if it's a small meeting or a last minute special meeting, you're going to have to notify us further in advance if you want to vote remotely, just to ease the burden on the people who are actually doing the paperwork. Um, we will have remote voting set up for anyone who needs it for that meeting. Additionally, quorum for that particular meeting is everyone who bothers to vote regardless of the number. So if we have ballooned at that point to 300 members, but it's been a while and 200 of those members have stopped showing up, 100 members can in fact constitute a quorum and oust a board member who's out of control. So that's something that's really important because we didn't want a situation where because some members stopped paying attention to the organization, there's no way to do anything about an out-of-control board because you guys are supposed to tell us when we're, I mean, our membership is supposed to tell us when we're being stupid. Um, and, and I do not by any means think that I'm not going to be the one who's being stupid one day. <laughs> Good observation, we're actually modeled off the Chaos Computing Club in Berlin. And that's actually a common structure for a nonprofit in Germany. It is, and we, um, we had to do some work to fit it into an American law context, but I think we've done a good job of that. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. <laughs> Anything else before I shut this down and make room for the next speaker to set up? There are definitely disadvantages to a 501c7. I'm going to tell you what they are, but I firmly believe that all of them we have chosen not to care about for this use case. One is you can't take in big donor money. Um, you don't get to sell advertising. You don't get to do those things that 501c3s frequently do to bolster their funds. You really are up to funding yourself. Um, we've decided that that's a good thing in our in our case because it keeps us honest, it keeps us focused on our member needs, not outside donor needs. But we just can't count on money that doesn't come from our members because if that ever becomes more than 35% of our income, we're dissolved, we're done. The IRS has no more to hear from us, we lose our status. Um, so that's a big disadvantage monetarily. Um, another disadvantage is that very few people in the U.S. at this point understand 501c7s. They haven't been introduced to them before. So we have a big educational burden every time we meet new people and want to help them understand what the organization is and what it does. Um, we are tax exempt like other 501c whatevers. But even having groups accept your paperwork, I've heard from a friend on another 501c7, he often has to do some education and say, no, I realize we're not a 501c3, that's what you're used to seeing, but yes, we're still tax exempt. You need to take my paperwork and let me be tax exempt. Um, there's a lot of education that goes on around that because it's a rarer structure today. Um, so those are the big two. I'd say the final one is 501c3s are 
because in part they're more familiar and because there's this idea that charities are out to help people and other groups aren't, I think that charities are more favorably viewed widely, so you get a lot of helping hands. Um, if we were a 501c3, there are a lot of organizations that would just let us use certain resources at a lower rate, um, just pay less. That's not open to 501c7s. Um, and I mean, we are very member focused. I can argue about the impact I think this has on the world. I think we all become better and we're better, to, we're better workers, better neighbors, a lot of better things for having been part of this group. Um, it's frequently not seen that way and we do pay higher rates for a lot of things. We've decided it's worth it. So, okay, I'm gonna wrap up here because we're about four minutes till the next speaker needs to come in, but I'll be out in the hallway if anyone has additional questions. Thanks for your time.